Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the BBCA forum today. Um, it's the last one of 2023. Can you believe that? Yeah, um, we have got a list of um, so I'm just unmuting myself, you can all hear me. Um, we have got a list of um, digital forums and physical forums for 2024 as well. So um, say so get on there, have a look and get registered for next year. But yeah, looking forward to today's agenda. I'm Natalie Bungay. I'll be your host, um, just introducing everybody and doing some Q&As and bits and pieces. And of course, keeping you all in order um, and giving you instructions. Um, but yeah, great to see you all here. I think we've got about 130 or 40 of you today who are joining still. Um, I'll do a few little introductions before we get started. Um, so yeah, today, just firstly, I want to say a huge thank you to Envu for being our sponsors. Um, we can't do these events with, without that. Um, and we'll be hearing from Richard Faulkner later on from Envu talking about early bed bug detection. So again, thank you for that. Um, just a quick reminder. So I don't know if anybody on here from Northern Ireland is listening, but if you are, we have um, a special networking event on the 19th of October. Um, basically, it's a bit different to a forum. We're going to be doing, uh, you can either come along for a morning breakfast or you can come along for an evening curry as well. It's just an opportunity for networking, meeting fellow professionals, obviously BBCA staff as well. Unfortunately, I won't be there, um, but um, some of my other colleagues will, will be there. John Horsley will be there. So, yeah, a great opportunity to get along. Um, if you can go onto our website, register. Lauren will, um, Lauren, my colleague who's on today, she'll pop in a link for anybody that would like to register for Northern Ireland. If you're thinking about going on a holiday at some point, why not go to Northern Ireland and uh, pop along to the event? So even if you're not based there, um, that'd be great. But do a few more updates at the end of the forum today with regards to events and things like that. But a really important one, Pestex registration is open for 2023. I can't believe it's come around already. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, 13th and 14th of March um, next year, 2024. Um, it's going to come around very quickly. So get registered. Lots of amazing talks. And also, if anybody, we're, we're just building the agenda for all these seminars in Pestex. So if anybody can think of any subjects that you would like us to cover in terms of business seminars or technical seminars, pop it in the chat. So there's a chat section you'll see at the bottom of your screen. That's a good area for you to, you know, say hello, say where you're from, um, ask any questions to my colleagues. So Lauren um, is sitting in the background there. If you have any problems with sound or anything with the technology, just pop it in the chat section. But again, also, if you have any ideas for presentations that we can do at Pestex, just, yeah, stick it in the chat. And um, Lauren would appreciate that a lot. Um, OK, so today um, on the agenda, we, um, of course, once I'm done, we've got um, John Stewart from Pelsis talking about foxes. Don't be out foxed. So um, we haven't covered foxes for a while. So I think that'll be um, a nice new subject for everybody. And yeah, certainly some great CPD. Um, after John Stewart at 1020, we've got Hazel Napier. She's from BEB Consultancy and talking about how you can improve your cash flow and um, reduce your risk by five simple steps. So a good sort of business, um, business talk there. Um, and then we'll have a comfort break just for 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll come back with Richard Faulkner from Envu doing a, a talk on early bed bug detection. Bed bugs are all over the news at the moment. Um, we've got a big outbreak in Paris and because of the Olympics next year, they're a bit worried about it. So um, we're certainly getting lots of talks going on. So I think that would be yeah, a great uh, refresher. And again, looking at that early detection of bed bugs with Richard. Um, after Richard, we've got Avril Turner from Kilgerm talking about stored product insects, um, tracking, trending and treatment. Um, so we've got a real variety of, um, of uh, pest talks today. So hopefully you're all excited about that. And then please hang on towards the end uh, just after Avril, because I'll be doing some just uh, updates, talk a little bit about glue boards, um, just to let everybody know where we are with that. Um, and again, a few other little bits I want to tell you about. So uh, make sure you hang around till the end at 12.30. Um, so I mentioned about the chat section, like I said, that's where you can just have a, a chat amongst yourself, put any ideas, anything you want to tell us about. Um, but after each seminar, we're going to do a Q&A session with the speakers. So again, down the bottom of your screen, depending on, on a phone or a laptop might be at the top, might be down the bottom, but Q&A, really important. If you've got a question for the speaker, please put it in the Q&A section. Um, we won't see it in the chat section just because there's a lot going on there. Um, I'm not looking at it. It's the Q&A section. So, um, and we love questions. It's always good to get them out there. Um, yeah, and we'll, we'll, we'll do that at the end of each presentation. 
uh, CPD points for today. So most of you obviously pre-registered. Um, so you'll have your CPD points automatically updated. You've got three for today. Um, if there's a few of you sat around one laptop and you've just done one registration under one CPD, all those other people sat around are not necessarily going to get the CPD points. So just make sure when we're done for today, um, if you're on the BBC registered scheme, you go on and update your points. If you're with Basis Prompt, let them know and they can give you instructions how to upload them. Um, so yeah, just you know, make sure you get those get those on. We're coming towards the end of the year, so we'll need to make sure we've got those those twenty points registered. And as I said, lots of variety today in terms of CPD. Um, one other um, reminder as well. So we have a charity of the year. Um, it's called Mind. I think most of you will be familiar with it for mental health um, issues that you know everybody can struggle with from time to time. So that's our charity of the year. We have a target of a thousand pounds. We are at where are we at at the moment? We are on seven hundred and eighty-five. So we're not far from the target. Um, it's you'll have an automatic link that will put you through to it during um, this this webinar. So even if you just donate what you can, um, a few quid here or there helps everything. Um, and hopefully we can get to that thousand pound target by the end of the year. Um, so I think that's everything. I'm no one's popped up to say that you know the sound is an issue or anything like that. I can see we've got lots of chat going on, so that's fabulous. Um, yeah. So as a quick update for me, quick introduction. If there's no other problem, then I would love to ask John Stewart from Palsis if you can show yourself, please. Um, there you are. Great. Uh, and then I'm mute. Back. Good morning, everybody. There we go. We can hear you. Perfect. So, John, tell us about foxes. I'll I'll leave you to it, and I'll see you in a bit for Q and A. Okay, no problem. You see that there now? we go. Fabulous. Yeah. All done. Yeah, you're you're very um unsure whether or not everybody can see it, and you don't want to be talking about something which isn't on the screen. It's not good. So, yeah. Good morning, everybody. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about um fox control today, and um yeah, it can be quite lucrative and um, some people make a, a business out of just controlling foxes so we'll run through this presentation and hopefully I can give you some food for thought and um, how you can maybe utilize this and, and use it in your business. Okay so we'll do a little bit about the biology so foxes um, they're a member of the dog family and they have reddish fur with a, a white tip tail um, both sexes are very similar in appearance although the, the male dog is generally larger. Um, they weigh around 6.5 kilograms, the male. Um, they're 110 centimetres from um, the tip of their nose to their tail. And the, the, um, they're about 40 centimetres uh, in height um, at the shoulder. And the female is generally uh, smaller, they're slightly, slightly smaller at 5.5 kilograms. Foxes are distributed throughout the whole of Europe. Um, Asia, North America, and Africa. In uh, the UK, they're found in various different environments or habitats, found in woodlands, farmlands, uh, moorland, urban and suburban areas. And in urban areas where most people will come across them, um, that's where the highest density of, of numbers will be, um, will be seen. And it can it can there can be differences uh, from city to city depending on um, habitat availability and also food. Um, in some areas, you'll get clumping together um, depending on what you say habitat. In fact, in one town, there's um, I think it's down in Horsham, the the foxes are being blamed for uh, chewing through brake cables because they've got a thirst for uh, brake fluid. And they've put this down to people actually feeding the foxes, which is encouraging lots of them into the area. So, yeah, feeding them should be discouraged. Foxes will dig their own earths. Sometimes they'll use old rabbit warrens or they'll take over part of um, a badger set. Um, most commonly, I've found them digging underneath people's decking or under a shed. Foxes are mostly nocturnal. Um, they may be seen during the day along railway embankments, um, in parks, cemeteries, and derelict land, overgrown gardens where they'll be out basking in the sun. Foxes do have a great ability to climb. They will off, often be seen walking along fence lines and along walls of gardens. Some people try to put spikes up and things like that to deter them from entering their garden. Um, they don't work that well. 
Foxes breed once a year, uh, with the cubs being born in March um, or April. The average litter size is four to five. Cubs start to venture out into the open um, late April onwards and will normally stay with the vixen um, until um, autumn. Some will remain with the, the female right up until January of the following year though. Urban fox cubs uh, will then disperse three to eight kilometers, so two, uh, two to five miles um, from their birthplace. Uh, foxes are born in, that are born in towns rarely move into rural areas. They're that used to scavenging for food um, because we have an abundance of it, stuff we discard or people feeding them will encourage them to stay um, in the vicinity. Foxes can live for over eight years, but most of them um, end up uh, a result of a uh, road traffic accident. A lot of them get um, get, get hit by vehicles. Um, sure, most of you that have been driving around have seen uh, fox carcasses at the side of the road. So in terms of diet, um, your um, urban fox is basically a scavenger. It will tip over bins and cause a real nuisance, shredding bags apart to get to, get to discarded um, food and, and litter that they can feed on. And I think this is becoming more evident with um, recycling because we're segregating our food now. So if you're like me, I've got a small caddy, they can easily push that over and get to any sort of chicken carcasses or anything they want to feed on. Um, they will eat a, a, a wide variety of stuff. So the, the diet consists of small mammals. So they will feed on rodents as well. Um, things like rats, uh, mice. They'll even take birds, including their eggs, reptiles, insects, earthworms, fruit and vegetables, um, and carrying that they can pick up from the sides of roads. Uh, there are real problem in gardens where people are uh, planting vegetables because they'll start to dig up the vegetable beds and uh, cause a real uh, a real nuisance to people. Um, they readily store food as well. So if, for instance, you're on a commercial site um, and there's a, a scope for them to actually create an earth underneath the actual building, they will drag uh, carrying under there or any food that they're predated on. And you can end up with secondary infestation of things like flies and domestic beetles, common clothes moth that will be feeding on the remnants of the carcasses which they've been feeding on. In terms of activity, when you're looking for signs or trapped hair on barbed wire fences or on fences, whether they're passing under or thorn bushes, um, they will you know, deposit some of these hairs on, on the fence. And it feels different be between um, that and badgers because badgers hair is very coarse and angular, whereas the, the fox hair is um, smooth when it's rubbed between the fingertips and index fingers. The droppings, um, they're pointed at both ends if they've been feeding on, um, on, on small rodents uh, and birds. These are the remnants of um, fur and feathers that could be um, in their feces or scats, which are deposited around. They often put them on top of molehills. So anybody that's doing a mole job, first thing I used to do is um, pick up a load of earth on your hands, rub it all over your all of your hands to dis um, to disguise any sort of scent you may have on your on your hands. Just be careful for um, for fox droppings. You don't want to rub that all over your hands. And I think they do this to um, mark the territory. And it's set up slightly higher than the, the rest of the ground, so um, any smell is um, blown downwind for um, other foxes to to pick up on. Other signs of activity will be um, footprints. So if you have a look in the mud or, or sand, if you have a look at the, um, the, the pads, they're different from a, a dog footprint in that you can actually um, put an imaginary cross right the way through the pads and the, the rear pad, which is triangular. And they have a very narrow print as well. It's only 35 to 50 millimeters in, in length and 35 in width. So they can be easily distinguished between um, a dog footprint. The scent, well, if anybody's ever had a, a fox in the, the back of the van in a, in a trap, then they will know what the smell's like. It's um, it's quite persistent. It lingers and it's, it's awful um, when they're, they're spraying urine around um, to scent mark. 
Uh, the dens are often outside where you will find the remnants of, um, of foodstuffs um, carrying, especially at the entrance. And sometimes you'll see um, cubs uh, playing around the entrance of their, um, of their dens. Reasons why we have to control them is, um, well, for instance, they will kill domestic um, animals, things like rabbits, guinea pigs, ducks and chickens that people will keep. Unlike many predators, foxes have the habit of killing more than they need to eat immediately. So they'll do surplus killing, which is also um, evident with uh, mink. They'll kill more than they actually need. They're also a nuisance. They'll dig up um, your garden. They'll defecate. They will bin raid. Um, they'll cause considerable nuisance and disturbance in urban areas. Gardens can be spoiled by uh, foxes if they establish themselves there, if they start to dig um, an earth. They will dig for invertebrates, they'll bury food, or they'll help themselves to fruit and vegetables. Um, and you also get these complaints of um, unearthly screams at night. They sound like a banshee at night screaming. They will wake people up. And this is most commonly heard uh, during December and February time when they're trying to get together to mate. So these vocalizations are them communicating with each other. They also transmit disease as well, things like sarcoptic mange mite, which um, a lot of the um, uh, urban foxes will carry and they will pass on to domestic animals and they can be passed on to humans as well, causing infestation of your, um, of your skin, causing irritation, uh, loss of fur and animals. In foxes, it will um, usually cause death. Um, because they're, they're going to lose far and they end up emaciated and run down. If you have a look at the difference between the rural foxes and urban foxes, you tend to find that the uh, urban foxes um, aren't as um, quite as pristine. They look, look kind of scabby. Foxes also carry a roundworm called Toxocara canis. It's an organism that can cause blindness in children. So if you come into contact with feces and if a child was to pick it up, on their hand and touch their eyes, they could end up um, blind as a result of it. And I said before about them having this thirst for brake fluid. Um, I've been speaking to various pest controllers and um, they've come across this phenomenon as well, especially in underground car parks where they'll run in at night and um, start to damage the vehicles. Some people have taken to shroud, shrouding the vehicle in tarpaulin or trying to um, shroud it in some sort of metal skirt to prevent them chewing through brake fluid. So in terms of control measures, um, fox, uh, fox management can be costly and time consuming. Therefore, management, sh management should be focused on prevention uh, and, and proofing. So that, that's the first sort of um, IPM sort of rule. You try to exclude them if you can. Um, as you can see, foxes uh, will split up from the fa uh, family group in October. Um, this would be a good time to implement sort of fencing at that point so that you're not going to deny um, the vixen access to the cubs and starving them to death. And um, you can implement um, electric fencing and things like that. Vixens will uh, seek uh, new breeding locations, and um, at, at that point, it's a good time to actually start backfilling um, their dens with, um, with sand and any earth that you can get hold of. You can see from this, uh, this um, calendar at the side of the page as well that most of the vocalizations are happening during sort of December and, and January season. So that's when people really start to notice them, um, keeping them awake at night, especially if you're um, especially if you're a light sleeper like I am. So in terms of control measures, um, we can use repellents to try and keep them away from sensitive areas. So this can be quite effective, but it, it can it can be quite uh, time consuming because you have to keep going back and retreating the area. Um, you're going to look for um, areas where they're urinating or defecating. You can see this, it looks like a scorching on the lawn. And at that point, you would mix the solution with um, five litres of water and then spray it onto the areas where they have been defecating. They will perceive this as being a, another fox and generally move away. It is biodegradable as well, so it's... Um, it's safe for 
um, for humans as well. It's um, pretty inert. Um, one of the things I would say about this particular product, if you're in an area where you get heavy rain, then it will be diluted and washed away. So in Scotland, where it rains all the time, you have to keep going back and replacing it. But in an underground car park, it'd be perfect for that. In terms of control measures, so um, trapping is a, is a good method. Um, it can be very successful in controlling foxes in, a, in an urban environment. Traps should be baited with a suitable uh, food source, such as chicken, um, cat food, or tuna works well. And you're better to disguise the actual cage itself. So have it in amongst the undergrowth, um, in some bushes or something like that, and cover it up so that the animal isn't um, exposed to the elements. Because once it's trapped, you don't want it suffering from hypothermia from the, the elements, especially if it's raining or it's cold outside, and you have to keep, uh, you know, have to ensure that there's, uh, there's water available for it as well. Then once you've got the, um, the animal trapped, I would never shoot it in the, um, in the residency. I would always take it away somewhere else to be destroyed, humanely uh, killed, um, or you would arrange to have a vet um, to euthanize it make those arrangements before you start the, the trapping program as well and don't ever release it somewhere else because it will then become somebody else's problem and if it's a, a fox that's been taken from an urban area and deposited into a rural area it's used to scavenging and it will probably struggle to to hunt and therefore die of um, starvation so it's never a good thing to do it's just to to release it somewhere else in terms of fencing, this is a type of fencing that can be erected. So you've got a 45 degree um, angle overhang. Um, and at the base, you have a 30 centimetre um, L shape at the bottom to stop them digging under the fencing. So this will prevent them jumping or digging underneath. Alternatively, um, electric fencing can be, um, can be erected as well. Um, it's generally a single strand. Uh, of electrified wire 25 centimeters above the ground and 25 centimeters out from the enclosed area and this will um, deter some foxes from getting access into say for instance if you've got chicken coops or something like that. In terms of uh, other control measures that can be um, utilized there's um, snaring. Uh, snaring is a humane method of control uh, when done correctly Snares must be free running and not self-locking. Uh, They're illegal to use. And in Scotland, you have to have um, a tag that goes on every single snare that's put down. And um, they're more to restrain the animals so that it can be dispatched once you come back to check the actual um, the, the snare itself. And these should be checked during daylight hours. And um, yeah, you dispatch them at that point. Um, the, um, they can be dispatched with a, a 0.22 rifle or a, a 0.250 center uh, rifle um, or a 12 bore shotgun. However, you have to have a, a gun license to do that. So if you, if you don't, then I wouldn't advise um, using snares as a method of control. You must be careful as well of non-target species. So in um, urban areas, I don't think this would be applicable. This would more be for rural pest control because you may end up with somebody's cat or a dog um, being trapped in one of these things, which um, doesn't go down too well. And if you're, sna uh, if you're snaring um, out in the countryside and there's uh, badgers present, I wouldn't advise using snares at all. So control measures, um, shooting. So shooting should only be done by a trained, experienced, qualified person. So if you are planning on taking up uh, fox work, I would go and um, get a gun license and um, get plenty of practice um, and team up with someone that does fox work to get to know um, the ins and outs of actually using this control method. And what you do is you position yourself downwind from the target and you make a, a squeaking sound that the fox um, can, can hear and it will turn around and look at you. If it's been spooked before by white light, then the chances are as soon as you 
shine the torch on it, the fox will bolt. So you can use a, a blue light or a red uh, filter on your torch or, or lamp um, to try and uh, prevent them uh, running away and getting scared. And you basically push your lips together and uh, make a squeaking noise like this. And the fox will stop and look at you. You'll catch its, um, its gaze at you. The, the light will reflect back from its eyes. And then it's at that point that you'll shoot it. So make sure you've got a good backstop um, and there's nobody present behind. In terms of legislation, so there's always legislation connected to everything that we do. So we have the Protection of Animals Act, uh, 1911. So foxes may not be poisoned. So there's no uh, commercially available poisons on the market to control foxes. You've got control of pesticides regs, uh, 1986. So pesticides may only be used for the purpose for which they have been approved. So no gassing materials have been approved for use of foxes. So anybody that uses aluminium phosphate for uh, control of rats, uh, moles or rabbits, you've got to be careful because um, you may find um, foxes living in the same vicinity as both um, rabbits and also badgers, and you do not want to gas one of them. They're also protected by the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, which prohibits the use of self-locking snares. You have to use free running snares, and they must be checked uh, during daylight hours at least once a day. Then we have the Wild Mammals Protection Act 1992. 1996, which prohibits the cruel treatment of any wild animal, but allows legitimate um, control um, from by pest controllers by human uh, means. So what this means is you have to um, look after the animal that you've got in your care, that you've trapped, and provide uh, food, water, and shelter from them, and kill them humanely. So we also have Animal Welfare Act, 2006 requires all animal, um, all captive animals to be treated humanely. And those who have set the trap up have the duty to actually go and check it as well. Don't put the onus on someone else. And that's it for me. Does anybody have any, any questions they'd like to ask? There we go. Thanks, John. That was, um, yeah, we, we, we've got a fair bit of time left. So, yeah, we can certainly uh, have a bit more of a chat about it. We've got two questions in there. So um, someone here says, whilst on the topic of prevention measure, measures, does anyone have any proven success with a solar or, or light up predator eyes that can be fixed onto fences? Mm. No. No. Yeah, no, I haven't uh, come across those. I mean, if anybody on the uh, webinar, uh, sorry, the forum today, as I had any experience of that, pop it in the chat section. Um, and yeah, again, use, use that for chatting amongst themselves. But have you ever heard of that, John? I don't know. I've never heard of predator eyes being put on fences or... Yeah, I've um, seen various um, sort of repellent methods to try and dissuade them. But I think the, um, the, the need to get food is far greater. So they'll, yeah, they'll just ignore it. Yeah, yeah. I suppose it's maybe a bit like some of the scaring devices we get for birds. It's kind of, you know, maybe not implemented properly or, or it's just in one place. They just kind of get used to it, really, don't they? And think, you know. Yeah, they become accustomed to it and um, habituated to any sort of noises that are emitted from them. So, yeah, they'll, they'll soon um, overcome that just through the need of, uh, to, to feed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That wasn't wine I was drinking, by the way, it's Sam Bell. No, no, it's fine. I've, I've no got my uh, cup of tea here. So it's, you know, it's lovely. And hopefully everybody else on here has, uh, you know, sat down with a nice hot drink or, or well, if they wanted wine. I don't know if I'd advise that, but yeah. <laughs> um, great. So Russell here, um, he's asked, will urban foxes damage car tyres? Um, he's, heard, he's heard from a few local residents um, that they think that foxes are chewing through car tires overnight but he's not sure whether it's foxes or maybe local vandals <laughs> probably local vandals i've not come across them chewing through tires but certainly um brake pipes and uh brake cables have they've been chewing through them they've got a real thirst for brake fluid i don't know what the the mm -hmm. attraction is but yeah if you okay, look on, on lines, wouldn't, that, wouldn't that wouldn't that 
harm them, like having drinking brake fluid. I don't know, would it? Probably, but yeah. yeah, they've got a real thirst for it and a taste for it. Yeah. If you go online, you can see plenty of newspaper articles where people have um, tried to get local councils to intervene because the amount of uh, damage they were causing. I think one street, there was like two and a half thousand pounds worth of damage caused to cars because they just went on a rampage tune through all the brake, brake cables. Yeah. Funny. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that sounds extreme. I suppose it's like of any pest, isn't it? You know, we have these surges of, you know, random activity. Like, well, why, why has that happened? Um, Maybe they're yeah. sick of being run over and they thought we'll get our own back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Terry here says, whatever happened to creosote? Mm, um, well, it's not it's not listed, is it, as a biocide, so I wouldn't advise spraying that around. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> quite a, yeah, lots of things have been taken from us uh, in the past and recently, isn't there? But um, again, create, what would what would creosote normally be used for, just for the pleasure of everyone here? I don't know, is it something you've used before to deter foxes? I don't know. No, nah, nah. no. Someone asked a question there about um, scoop for cats. Um, no, it doesn't work that well, but you can buy lion dung from various shops that you can spread around your flower beds to try and dissuade cats from uh, digging and defecating in um, in your garden. So you can buy actual lion poo. Yeah, you can buy a bucket of it. Hmm. That's, that's, a jo- that's a job and a half, isn't it? Going around uh, collecting that. I mean, I'd quite happily volunteer to do that. So I'm assuming it'd be in a nice, uh, nice place in the world, but collecting lion poo. Is it synthetic or is it actually... No, it's actual lion dung. Yeah, you can okay. buy it, they, obviously, from zoos. Or, okay. Yeah, they, they'll harvest this stuff, um, bag it, sell it, and then, yeah, it gets sold commercially from various garden centres. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, wherever there's a buck, hey. <laughs> but, yeah, great. And it and it's natural, really, I suppose, to a degree. It's, you know, preventing yeah. chemicals around, so... That's great. Um, so Steve here said, um, uh, he's surprised um, you suggest never shooting a fox at a, the location. He always, um, in, sorry, I always do this and warn the customer in advance that this is what will happen. Moving them could be causing unnecessary suffering and therefore offence under wildlife and animal, uh, sorry, animal welfare. Do you know what? And I get this a lot where people ring me and say, you know, Natalie, foxes or squirrels, or whatever, should I, one the other day, should I dispatch them in situ or put them and move them because that could distress them? So actually it's a real topic of conversation at the minute. I have um, been in situations where, especially with squirrels, I've um, doing live trapping, I've had people that have been very averse. It's a very emotive subject. As soon as people see wildlife being removed, um, the, you know, they're not happy and it can cause all sorts of um, altercations between ourselves and the public and it doesn't put us in a good light, I don't think. So mm-hmm. I would try to do it. Yeah, if you can do it in situ and it's out of sight, then by all means. But if it's if it's going to cause distress to onlooking neighbours, I would do it out of sight, out of mind. I've actually had the SSPCA called on myself right. uh, when we were doing our... Uh, a trapping program for squirrels. Uh, the SSPCA were absolutely happy with everything we were doing, um, but this one uh, chap had uh, taken it upon himself to cause an absolute ruckus and was um, very threatening, um, threatening the neighbour um, and ourselves. So yeah, I would always always do it out of sight. Yeah, it is very, very emotive, agree. And I think in terms of the animal welfare, um, you know, there's like, you know, in the legislation, it doesn't say you must not remove this animal and put it, you know, and and, and transport it anywhere and dispatch it anywhere. It just doesn't say that. It just says no. that you've got to obviously um, reduce suffering and make sure they don't suffer as much as possible. So, you know, if you do, my, my advice is always, I don't know if you agree with this, but um, if you feel you need to dispatch it elsewhere, then, you know, put in a cover over the cage, be it a fox or a squirrel, making sure they're calm as possible, you know, carrying the cage in a way that's, you know, respectful of them being in there and back of the car. I don't know. That's the kind of trying to keep stress levels down, I think, is the key, isn't it? Yeah. And providing food and water for them. Yeah. That's exactly. that's key. Um, and obviously, if you're if you are going to transport it somewhere, it's not going to be too far from where you actually pick the cage up. You don't want it in the vehicle for any longer than you, you know, than it needs to mm-hmm. be. So yeah. yeah. But um, every situation is different. So yeah, completely. I mean, apologies if you covered this and I missed it. Um, I don't think I did because I was watching all of it, but in terms of 
re-releasing so obviously gray squirrels we can't you know the and wildlife and countryside app we're not allowed to it's illegal to re-release them but with foxes it doesn't actually technically say that anywhere does it but actually in terms of animal welfare and things like that would it it's not something that happens is it what about releasing foxes it's it's abandonment because um if you're taking a fox from a, a town and moving it somewhere else it's not going to have um those um, innate skills to be able to hunt for itself it's been that used to being probably hand fed by somebody or reading bins so I, I think it's better to dispatch the animal it's mm -hmm. far far um it's far kinder to let it um to, to dispatch it uh, humanely than let it starve to death and of course you're then moving that problem onto someone else mm -hmm. so it's going to cause someone else real issues mm -hmm. Are they, could it also be with, you know, if you're releasing a fox in an area, whether it's a mile away or 20 miles away, um, it's obviously in a new territory. There could be other dominant foxes in that territory. So there's probably going to be fights and probably death anyway through. Is, is that is that a thing? Is that possibly what would happen? That could potentially happen. Uh, someone else uh, commented about um, moving foxes. The, the RSPC do it all the time. I've actually heard of them um, releasing squirrels as well, but that's a that's another yeah, uh, yeah. That's, that's another yeah. problem for another day yeah. <laughs> um sorry yeah lots of questions i think it's relating to the question we just had as a uh, sticking those bits out because they're, they're the things that i get asked all the time so you know we've got 237 people here so um it's good to you know get to the masses so appreciate yeah talking to me about that i get um, asked about it as well during training every time you do training and you broach the subject of foxy yeah. that's one of the things that is commonly brought up yeah yeah that's it. Um, uh, Darren's asked, do sonic deterrence work? No. No, no they don't. <laughs> no, didn't think they were. I didn't even know if there would be advertised for oh, Fox Control. I don't know. Maybe they do on, on amateur platforms. I'm not sure. No. Yeah, and you get this habituation to the noise and, you know, they'll, they'll become accustomed to it. And if the, the draw's there because the food or there's harborage um, that they can set up a, a den then yeah if if the the, the draw is too too much they will still come. excuse me <laughs> yeah right um there's a few people actually on the q a commenting about the blake uh, blake break fluid um and there's someone uh, davina asked is it the same for cats as it is for foxes mm. will, will cats do that i've never heard of cats tuned for um break pipes now yeah if anyone else has on here pop it in the chat section and i like, oh yeah. you know experienced it but no I, I haven't heard that before either um uh, there's in a few more comments um Elizabeth here said she heard that there was something organic in the brake fluid that they like um and someone else said it's the glyce glycol glycol in the brake fluid yeah. apparently that they're attracted to yeah That's glycol. anything with oil on it's uh an alcohol isn't it so yeah thirst for that <laughs> indeed um uh, some comments Terry just said Chris it uses a, a deterrent yeah back in the day uh, Colchester Zoo apparently sells lion dung so just if anyone's looking for any um, tap them up um, Darren's asked on a local group people are advising the males in the household to urinate over the garden as a deterrent oh <laughs> <laughs> You might get arrested for um, <laughs> oh, it's your own garden maybe you know like don't look like around the streets kind of offering your services to people they might be freaked out a bit but would yeah. that, I mean probably don't know because no one's ever talked about it but surely human would would that deter foxes I don't think so because um if you go up uh, some of the back alleyways in city centers where drunk revelers um urinate you often see um foxes up there shredding bags apart trying to get to um food waste from from restaurants and things like that yeah 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 I mean, on the repellents, um, Ali's asking, is that are there are there any repellent products for fox control? Just scoop, really. That's the only one that I know of, and I've used it myself, and it was um, successful. It was in someone's back garden. Um, I had to keep going back and reapplying it for a period of time until the the, the fox got the, the the message. But mm -hmm. you'll find that if you don't use it year on year, you'll end up with um, reinfestation again. Yeah. Did they change the active, I say active ingredient, the the, the main ingredient to that a few years ago? Because it rings a bell that something changed. I can't remember off the top no. of my head. It was a long time ago. I think it was yeah. when I was probably working down south, which you know, was probably 15 years ago. Where does time go, honestly, John? Um, uh, Mike's asked, are foxes deterred by mirrors? Um, I'm not too sure. <laughs> yeah. I've not come across that one before. 
It's whether or not they kind of have a, an affliction against their reflection, I suppose. But yeah, it depends how ugly they are, really. Well, that's it, exactly. Yeah. I suppose with the light, maybe, you know, as they're moving around, they see the light reflection from the moon in the mirror and it's moving, they might kind of think, oh, um, I suppose, give it a go, why not? But it's just whether or not a customer's willing to pay for something that might not work, I don't, yeah. They may think it's another fox that's present, so they'll see the reflection of themselves and not not recognise it as themselves and may, may think, oh, there's another fox already in the area. I don't mm-hmm. know, I've not, not come across that one before. No. no. Um, lots of people suggesting some good things. Terry's just said there's another product called Silent Raw, which is um, a decent repellent. It mimics the lion dung, apparently. It's not actual lion dung, but have you heard of that one? I haven't, no. no. There we go, Silent Raw. Not promoting anyone's particular products at any stage, but I'm guessing there aren't really any other people that uh, produce these things. So um, that's good. And then last one, so about the cats. Um, there was a criminal case here in Iceland, or oh, they're in Iceland, of a local man who fed the local cats fish marinated in marinated in antifreeze. And that's more of a comment, but yeah, it's crazy what people will do to um, deter animals. That would be catastrophic, wouldn't it? Honestly, yeah, it's yeah, it's sad really, but that's probably an issue with that person rather than an industry thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> them doing things like that but I think any control but certainly foxes and what I've experienced it is an emotive subject like like you said I think if you're going into fox control whether you do it already or you're dabbling in it or thinking about it a big thing is obviously the welfare of the animal firstly and but then also the opinion the 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 social side of controlling foxes because it is very emotive and you can have one person that's distressed that they're in the garden but the next door neighbor can be a real avid fan and cause some real problems can't they yeah i've had it where people have been feeding the foxes and um, have been accustomed to them and they frequent the garden quite a lot and they'll um, lay under shrubs and things like Mm -hmm. that and they'll actually cast uh, fleas off as well so and they've ended up with flea infestation in the house because the household pets are picking them up as well. So yeah, yeah. it's not it's not a good thing to do. To, no. Yeah. No, I I had, I remember trying to deal with foxes down in London once. Now I was using an expert, I was working with somebody who was an expert in it, but I was just getting involved and wanted to learn a bit more about it. And uh, like the day, I think it was doing some pre-baiting, getting ready to do some shooting from above in a large building. Um, And yeah, the day before they kind of ring us and say, all the newspapers have turned up. They've heard from somebody that you're going to be shooting foxes and they're, you know, coming for you basically. So we had to kind of cancel the whole thing. But I think being discreet about it is important as well and not, you know, um, publicising too much that you're doing fox control. This, this was in, on a commercial site. So I think the security guards who had to know about what was going on possibly mentioned it to someone and then it just kind of exploded. So, yeah, again, I'm just reiterating the sensitivity of it all and, you know, know what you're doing and dealing with not just the fox, but the people around you. So, yeah, it's a good subject. Really appreciate that. Um, so yeah, there's no more questions that have popped up. I don't think there were any in chat that uh, accidentally have gone in there. Um, uh, no, we're good. We're good. Um, but yeah, thanks so much, John. It's a subject we don't cover that often because it is quite niche, but an important one. So appreciate that a lot. And people can get in touch with you if they wanted to chat to you more about it. Yeah, certainly. No problem at all. Um, I forgot to actually mention, if you're not able to make that squeaking sound to attract the fox, you can buy commercially available squeakers as well that you just put between your lips um, and you push your lips and and blow it and you should attract the foxes that way. So when you did it, I think your mic didn't want to pick up on it. So give us another go. Let's see if we can hear it. Go on. You're not going to do it now, are you? (laughs) No pressure. Put on the spot here. Oh, yeah. not picking it up that's weird not? Oh, no strange. no maybe, oh, maybe right. zoom has trademarked the uh the, the fox squeal noise and you're not allowed so i know sometimes if you play music in the background on zoom it won't come through the speaker because it's almost like a control thing but no yeah can't hear it Darn. No, if you go online there's um various people that um will mimic it and show you how to do it yeah yeah some people use the back of their hand yeah, yeah. well i know what i'll be doing in the break anyway uh <laughs> I'm not very good at that stuff. So. Someone will say what the fox are. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Yeah, what's the point? Yeah, that's, I like that. And on that note, John, thank you very much. Um, you, appreciate it. Take care. Yes. Bye-bye.